ancient peoples were as creative as we are today. So for today's video, we're counting down the 15 most bizarre ancient inventions. Let's start with number 15, the Lycurgus Cup. The Lycurgus Cup is an artifact from the Roman Empire, dating back to around 1600 years ago. Named after Lycurgus, a figure from Greek mythology, it features him being entangled by vines in a scene from the myth where Lycurgus attacked Dionysus and was punished by being ensnared in vine tendrils. Of course, many cups and objects have been found from Roman times, but there's something that makes this one truly unique and far ahead of its time. That's because it's made from something called dichroic glass. Impressively, the glass appears to be jade green when lit from the front, but transforms into a translucent ruby red when light shines through it from behind. This dramatic change in color is due to the presence of minute quantities of gold and silver, which alter the way the light is reflected and transmitted through the material. The exact process used to create this effect was lost to history and remained a mystery until modern nanotechnology provided some understanding in the 20th century. As well as this advanced understanding of material science, the detailed scenes depicted on the cup were carved into the glass using a technique called diatretum, which involves deep cutting and grinding to produce a raised relief effect. The craftsmanship and artistry required to produce such detailed work on a material that is both fragile and difficult to work with highlight the advanced skills of the artisans of the time. Today, the Lycurgus Cup is on display in the British Museum in London and continues to fascinate scientists, historians, and art lovers, with only a few people in modern times capable of recreating its appearance. Number 14. The Hufeng Didongyi The Hufeng Didongyi is also known as the Seismoscope of Zhang Heng. It's an ancient Chinese invention that is one of the earliest known devices to detect earthquakes. Created in the year 132 by the astronomer, mathematician, inventor, and engineer Zhang Heng, the device shows the advanced understanding of natural phenomena by ancient Chinese civilizations. Zhang Heng's seismoscope was a large, ornately decorated bronze vessel featuring eight dragons sitting around its edge, each one facing the main points on the compass. Beneath the dragons were eight bronze toads positioned to catch balls that the dragons would release in the event of an earthquake. The mechanism behind this ingenious device allowed it to detect seismic waves from earthquakes occurring at great distances, even hundreds of miles away, and indicate the direction of the quake's epicenter. The workings of it remain a subject of much speculation, as no detailed descriptions of its internal mechanisms have survived to this day. It's believed that the device uses a pendulum or some other form of inertial mass to sense the ground movement, which would then trigger a mechanism to release a ball from the mouth of the corresponding dragon. This early warning system not only provided valuable information about the direction of a quake, but also allowed for assistance to be sent if it was thought that an important place had been affected. Despite the loss of the original invention and the complete records about its design, the Hufeng Didongyi continues to be a celebrated symbol of ancient China's contributions to the scientific world. Modern reconstructions and studies attempt to understand it and replicate it, but by using materials and processes available at the time, it's so far been impossible to recreate. Number 13. The Aeola Pile The Aeola Pile, which is known as Hero's Engine, is one of the earliest known examples of a steam engine, which amazingly dates back to the first century. Designed by Hero of Alexandria, an ancient Greek mathematician and engineer who was known for his contributions to the field of pneumatics, mathematics, and physics, the Aelo Pile offers a glimpse into the early understanding of steam power and mechanics. The device itself is simple in design, but it shows a sophisticated grasp of the principles of steam propulsion. It consists of a hollow sphere mounted on a pair of opposing nozzles. The sphere is attached to a water-filled boiler through an axle that allows it to rotate freely. And when the water is heated and then steam is produced, it escapes through the nozzles, creating a thrust that causes the sphere to spin rapidly. This reaction is a practical application of the third law of motion long before Newton described it, that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Despite its clever design, the Aelo pile was not used for practical uses in Heron's time, and the Greeks weren't traveling by steam engine. Instead, it was considered a curiosity or demonstration piece to illustrate the principles of steam power and pressure and showcase the potential of steam as a source of propulsion, a concept that wouldn't be fully realized until the advent of the steam engine in the 17th and 18th centuries, which played a critical role in the Industrial Revolution. Number 12. The Viking Sunstone The Viking Sunstone, a legendary navigational aid from the Viking Age, allegedly allowed Viking navigators to locate the position of the sun even on cloudy or foggy days, which gave them a crucial edge when voyaging across the North Atlantic. 
The existence of the sunstone is mentioned in medieval texts, including sagas and historical records, which described its use in navigation before the invention of the magnetic compass in Europe. The precise nature and working of the Viking sunstone remains a subject of debate and mystery, though. Scholars suggest that it was likely a type of crystal, such as calcite, cordite, or tourmaline, which are all known for their optical properties, including the ability to polarize light. Through a process called birefringence, these crystals could have been used to detect the direction of the sun by observing the sky's polarization pattern, a method that could be effective even when the sun was obscured. Experimental archaeology and modern scientific testing have lent support to the theory that the sunstones actually existed, with researchers showing that by using a crystal, in accordance with historical descriptions, it is possible to pinpoint the sun's position with a degree of accuracy that would have been useful for navigation. No archaeological examples have been found yet, though, which is strange because plenty of Viking vessels have been unearthed. This means there remains some skepticism about the stones, whether they were just a legend created by their enemies to explain why they were so good at seafaring, or perhaps why they were so important to the Vikings that they were treated like precious objects and never actually left on ships. Number 11. Tisibius's Water Clock Tisibius's water clock, which was called the Clepsydra, was another device that was created well ahead of its time. Living in Alexandria, Egypt, more than 2,300 years ago, Tisibius was a prolific inventor and scholar, credited with a range of innovations in the field of pneumatics, as well as improvements to timekeeping devices. His water clock is particularly notable for introducing a level of accuracy and sophistication previously unseen in the measurement of time. The Clepsydra, or Water Thief, was not a new invention in Tisibius' time, but he revolutionized its design. Traditional water clocks simply allowed water to drip at a consistent rate, with the passage of time marked by the water level in a container. However, these early models caused inaccuracies due to changes in water flow rate as the container filled, so Tisibius addressed this by incorporating a complex system of gears, floats, and valves to regulate the flow and maintain a steady rate, regardless of the water level in the reservoir. One of the most ingenious aspects of Tisibius's water clock was its adaptability to display time in a visual and easily understandable form. He achieved this through a series of mechanical additions, including a float with a peg that rose with the water level, driving a gear mechanism that turned a dial or moved a pointer. This allowed for the precise indication of hours and even fractions of minutes, making it one of the most advanced timekeeping devices of its age. Number 10. The South Pointing Chariot in modern times, we're fortunate to have navigational aids that can always tell us which direction we're pointing in if needed, from compasses to nowadays the smartphones that we carry with us. Before magnetism was discovered, though, the concept of a compass was seemingly impossible, but that didn't mean that there wasn't a way to know which way you were looking. The South Pointing Chariot was an ancient Chinese invention that dates back to the Zhu Dynasty more than 3,000 years ago. Cleverly, this mechanical contraption was designed to point which way was south, no matter the chariot's orientation, without relying on magnetism. To do this, the chariot was equipped with a figure, often a doll or a pointer, which consistently pointed south, no matter how the chariot moved. This was achieved through a differential gear system, which was a technology that would not be seen in the West until the Renaissance. The gears translated the rotation of the wheels into the opposite rotation of the figure on top, ensuring it always faced the same direction, a concept that required precise calculation and manufacturing skills to ensure its accuracy. The South Pointing Chariot's existence was well documented in historical texts, which described its mechanical complexity and cultural significance, but despite this, no original chariots have survived to the present, and our understanding of their precise working comes from historical records and recent reconstructions by historians and engineers. As well as being extremely useful when navigating across the continent, designs like these show the application of mathematical principles and mechanical engineering long before such concepts were even conceived in the Western world. The chariot's ability to maintain a constant direction, regardless of the path taken, was not only hugely clever, but also served practical purposes in surveying, military strategy, and ceremonial processions, helping the empire spread far quicker than would have otherwise been possible. Number 9. Damascus Steel Often spurred on by the needs of warfare, metallurgists have always tried to create materials that are stronger and tougher than anything else. Amazingly though, there's a substance from history that remains the strongest ever, and we've completely forgotten how to produce it. Known as Damascus Steel, it originated in the Near East, with the name popularly attributed to the Syrian city of Damascus. 
believed to have been forged into weapons and tools as early as 1700 years ago. It became known for its sharpness, resilience, and flexibility, which made Damascus steel swords and knives highly prized and sought after across the ancient world. The secret of Damascus steel's properties lies in its unique manufacturing process, which involves the combination of layering different types of steel and iron at high temperatures. This process, known as pattern welding, saw layers of steel being forged with different carbon contents, which were then folded and hammered out repeatedly. This labor-intensive method not only created the characteristic wavy patterns on the steel surface, but also resulted in a material with exceptional hardness and the ability to retain a sharp edge, while remaining flexible enough to resist shattering upon impact. But what truly sets Damascus steel apart, however, was the use of Wut steel as its base material. Wutz, which is a high-carbon steel produced in India, contained trace amounts of impurities and other elements such as vanadium, which contributed to the steel's distinctive patterns and physical properties. The precise control of the steel's carbon content and the smith's skill in manipulating the material were crucial in producing the highest quality Damascus. The art of making traditional Damascus steel was, though, lost by the 18th century, likely due to running out of the specific ores used in its creation, or the loss of the specialized knowledge required. Despite this, modern metallurgists and blacksmiths have tried to recreate this material, inspired by the legend and the few remaining artifacts crafted from the original Damascus. But still, they have not managed to truly replicate it yet. Number 8. Greek Fire Greek fire was first developed in the year 672, and it was used by the Eastern Roman Empire, also known as the Byzantines, in naval battles. It was an incendiary weapon that burnt at high temperatures, and would even continue to burn when it was on water. Records mention its use through to the 12th century, but as other weapons were developed, it fell out of fashion. Despite knowing how it was deployed in warfare, though, very little is known about the chemical composition of Greek fire. No samples have survived testing, so all researchers can do is theorize about how it was made. The leading theory used to be the main ingredient was saltpeter, which would mean it was an early form of gunpowder. Descriptions of thunder and smoke would support this idea, but later research found that the substance was only used in Europe or the Middle East from the 13th century onwards, so it isn't likely to be part of the original Greek fire ingredients. Another suggestion, based on the fact that it would burn when on water, is that it contained quicklime. It reacts with water, so it would explain accounts of how the flames continued to intensify and was a substance known to be used at the time. Quicklime has also been counted out, though, because it needs to come into contact with water to produce the effects. There are numerous reports of Greek fire being poured directly onto the decks of ships, so to achieve this effect, there must have been some other flammable element involved. Nowadays, scholars believe that the principal ingredient was a form of petroleum. The Byzantines are known to have had access to crude oil in the natural wells around the Black Sea, so they would have had a plentiful supply. This is also supported by the alternate name for Greek fire, Median fire. The Greeks referred to crude oil as Median oil, so it would imply it was at least one of the basic ingredients. Without getting an actual sample of the liquid, it'll be virtually impossible to explain how Greek fire actually worked. No literature has been found from the time that mentions the constituent parts, so it'll be left to weigh up competing theories that are proposed by experts in the field. Moving on to number 7, the Shagir Idol. The Shagir Idol, which was discovered in 1894, is a peat bog near Shagir on the eastern slopes of the Ural Mountains in Russia. It's a strange artifact that's a sophisticated artistic and symbolic expression by prehistoric humans, with a design that was far ahead of what should have been possible at the time. Radiocarbon dating has revealed that this wooden sculpture, standing at a height of approximately 9.2 feet, is over 12,000 years old, making it the oldest known wooden sculpture in the world. This places it at the end of the last ice age, a time when the Earth was undergoing significant climatic changes and human society was going through the Neolithic Revolution. Crafted from a single larch log, the Shagir idol is covered with a series of carved motifs and humanoid faces. The geometric patterns and faces etched into its surface have led scholars to speculate about their potential symbolic or religious significance, suggesting that the idol may have served as a totem or an object of worship for the hunter-gatherer society that created it. The fact that it's even survived is impressive, too, as the acidic conditions of the peat where it was found played a critical role in preventing the wood from decaying over the millennia. Despite this preservation, the idol is not complete, with original estimates suggesting it may have once stood over 16 feet tall. Number 6. The Nimrud Lens 
The Nimrud lens is a surprising artifact that dates back to around 750 BC and comes from the Assyrian city of Nimrud in modern-day Iraq. Discovered in 1850 by Austin Henry Layard, this piece of rock crystal, which is roughly oval in shape, is about 1.7 inches in diameter and is believed to be the oldest known optical lens. The lens's slight convex shape and precision suggest a sophistication in craftsmanship that shows a much more advanced understanding of optics by ancient civilizations than had been previously realized. The purpose of the lens, though, has been subject of debate among historians, archaeologists, and scientists ever since it was found. Some think that it was used as a magnifying glass, aiding Assyrian artisans with intricate designs. Others have suggested it may have served an astronomical purpose, possibly as part of a telescope for looking to the skies. But there's also some who argue that the lens's optical qualities were accidental, and that it was just actually a decorative object or an amulet. The crafting of the Nimrud lens certainly seems to be a deliberate attempt to manipulate light, though. And while the precise nature of what it was used for is unclear, it's more evidence of the advanced knowledge of the Assyrians, who were among the pioneers in various fields including astronomy, mathematics, and engineering. They were a civilization that was fascinated with exploring and understanding the natural world with various tools, so it makes sense they would have created a lens like this to assist in those pursuits. Who knows, they may have even been charting planets in our solar system centuries before modern astronomers. Number 5. The Tower of the Winds The Tower of the Winds, which is also known as the Horologion of Andronikos Kirhestes, is one of the most over-engineered and impressive ancient timepieces that survive to these days. Also featuring a weather vane, it's in the Roman Agora of Athens in Greece, and it was built more than 2100 years ago. Octagonal in shape and made from marble, it combines functionality with aesthetics, reflecting the Hellenistic interest in both architecture and science. Measuring about 39 feet high and about 26 feet in diameter, the Tower of the Winds gets its name from eight wind gods depicted on it, each facing a direction from which the corresponding wind blows. These carvings not only serve an artistic purpose, but also function as an early form of meteorological observation, indicating the tower's role in tracking weather patterns. The sundials carved on each of the tower's eight sides allowed for tracking of time throughout the day, while the interior housed a complex water clock or clepsydra. This clock was essential in this city for timekeeping during the night or on cloudy days when sundials wouldn't work. Today, the Tower of the Winds still stands in place as a reminder of ancient innovation and draws visitors from around the world. As one of the earliest known meteorological stations and public timepieces, it shows the historical importance of timekeeping and weather observation in human civilization, and how advanced the ancient Greeks were in understanding of concepts like these. Number 4. The Ilmer of Malmesbury's Flying Machine while the first powered flight by humans took place in the early 20th century by the Wright brothers, people have been inventing potential ways to fly for far longer. Of course, da Vinci is famous for sketching concepts in the late 15th century, but he wasn't close to being the first. One of the earliest examples of inventions where the designs can still be seen comes from the Ilmer of Malmesbury, who was a Benedictine monk from the early 11th century who lived in Malmesbury Abbey in England. He was known for his deep interest in astrology, but also came up with an innovative attempt to fly. His flying machine was essentially a set of wings, which he attached to his hands and feet, and had been inspired by the classical myth of Daedalus and Icarus. According to the historical accounts, Eilmer believed that with enough study and the right design, he could mimic the birds and glide through the air, an ambitious endeavor that was driven by a mix of scientific curiosity and perhaps a touch of the mystical thought that was prevalent in his time. The most detailed account of Eilmer's flight comes from William of Malmesbury, who wrote an account in the 12th century. William describes how Eilmer, having constructed his apparatus, launched himself from the Tower of Malmesbury Abbey. Amazingly, he managed to glide for more than a furlong, which is the equivalent to more than 700 feet, before landing, but unfortunately resulted in him injuring himself. This attempt at flight is actually an important moment in the history of human attempts to take to the skies and the human obsession to prove a concept even if it poses a risk to their own safety. While it didn't eventually amount to anything and was a bizarre and brazen attempt, he does deserve credit for what he tried to do. Number 3. Roman Concrete Across Europe and the rest of the former Roman Empire, countless structures are still standing, and you may wonder how this is possible after more than 2,000 years, especially as more modern structures seem to fall more easily. The answer is a substance called Roman concrete, or opus cementicium, which was different to the types we use today, and in many ways was far tougher and stronger. 
Unlike modern concrete, which relies on Portland cement for its binding properties, Roman concrete was made using a mixture of volcanic ash, lime, and seawater, along with pieces of volcanic rock and brick chips as aggregate. This unique composition, particularly the use of ash, gave Roman concrete its remarkable durability, especially in marine environments. The chemical reactions between the volcanic ash and the lime produced a material that could withstand the test of time, resisting decay and erosion far better than many modern concretes. One of the most impressive traits of Roman concrete is its ability to self-heal. Researchers have discovered that when cracks form in it, the presence of lime and volcanic material allows for the growth of mineral crystals that can fill the cracks when exposed to water, effectively repairing the structure over time. It was one of the most important inventions of the time, as the Romans' mastery of the material allowed them to create vast open interior spaces without the need for numerous supporting columns, something that revolutionized architectural design. The Pantheon, with its massive concrete dome, remains the largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world to this day, which shows just how capable the Roman engineers were. Number 2. The Phaistos Disc The Phaistos Disc was discovered in 1908 by Italian archaeologist Luigi Pernier in the ancient Minoan palace of Phaistos on the island of Crete in Greece, and it's become one of archaeology's most intriguing discoveries. Dating back to around 4,000 years ago, the clay disc is about 5.9 inches in diameter and is covered on both sides with a spiral of stamped symbols. Its purpose, along with the meaning of the inscribed symbols, remains a mystery, despite many experts having tried to decode it. The disc is made of fine clay and features 241 tokens, consisting of 45 distinct symbols, which include images of humans, animals, plants, and geometric figures. These symbols are believed to have been made using preformed character stamps, which suggests that the Phaistos disc could represent an early form of movable type printing. The way the symbols are arranged in a tight spiral leading from the edge to the center on both sides of the disc indicates an advanced understanding of design and possibly an attempt at a story or record keeping. Experts have suggested a number of theories around the disc's function and the meaning of its symbols, thinking it might be a religious document, a calendar, a game, or a story. But the mystery of the Phaistos disc is further increased by the fact that it's the only one of its kind, with no other object bearing the same writing or using a similar stamping technique. This makes it difficult to place within a broader cultural or linguistic context. This has even led some to question the disc's authenticity, although the majority of experts accept it as genuine. The disc's importance isn't just in its mysterious script, but also in what it reveals about the technological capabilities and cultural practices of the Minoan civilization. The use of stamps to create repeated symbols suggests the level of organization and sophistication in their approach to communication and record keeping. So it continues to be a focal point for research into the Aegean Bronze Age, offering potential insights into the administration, religion, and daily life of one of the ancient world's most advanced cultures. Number 1. The Rocks at Sacsayhuaman Sacsayhuaman is a fascinating archaeological site that's located on the outskirts of Cusco in Peru. It's built in the Inca civilization. It's a fortress temple complex believed to have been constructed in the late 15th century under the reign of the Inca Emperor Pachacuti. The structure itself is impressive enough, but when researchers took a closer look to how it was built, they discovered a highly advanced method of construction that would be difficult to replicate even today. It was built using massive, meticulously cut stone blocks that fit together without the use of any mortar, and has remained standing for more than 500 years. The largest of these blocks stands at over 16 feet high and weighs over 100 tons, but they're so precisely joined that not even a blade of grass could be inserted between them. This level of craftsmanship is remarkable, considering the Incas didn't use iron tools or the wheel for construction. The technique, known as ashlar masonry, required a sophisticated understanding of stoneworking, geometry, and engineering, and is arguably the most surprising and impressive invention from the time. This may seem more plausible in a simply shaped structure, but to further complicate things, Sacsayhuaman was designed with zigzagging walls that are thought to represent the teeth of a puma, a sacred animal in Inca cosmology, with Cusco itself conceived as the body of the puma. Despite their knowledge of how to build like this, it would have been a major undertaking. Sacsayhuaman is believed to have taken several decades involving tens of thousands of workers, including skilled craftsmen and laborers, who transported these massive stones from quarries over 12 miles away. Quite the exact purpose of Sacsayhuaman remains a topic of debate among historians and archaeologists, with theories suggesting it served as a military stronghold, a ceremonial site, or both. Today, it's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is a major tourist destination, drawing visitors from around the world who come to see the impressive structure. 
The site does stand as a powerful reminder of the Inca civilization's ingenuity and their mastery of architecture and engineering, but at the same time poses intriguing questions about the methods and tools used in its construction, many of which remain unknown, adding to the mystery of the site. Thanks for watching everyone, I'll see you next time. Thank you to our channel members.